Okay. All right, guys. So we're at Colossians 1, 9 through 4, or sorry, uh, 15 through 19. Um, <clears throat> let, me, let me say this right as we're starting here. So Jesus, he's the, uh, the subject of these verses 15 through 19. But can I just remind us all that Jesus is actually the subject of the entire Bible? Did you know that? We did this Old Testament survey on Thursday nights, and that's one of the things that's really coming out of the study. Every week you see Jesus is on every page of the Old Testament. You know, I saw this this week. Do you guys know how to sign the Bible? You ever seen that? How this, anybody sign like for deaf people? No? Okay, well, I, I found out what that sign is. Let me show it to you. This is Jesus. You know why? The nails in his hands. This is book. The sign for, G, uh, for the Bible is Jesus book. That's what the Bible is. It's the Jesus book. Amen. You know, the, let me read you something from the Gospel of Luke. Listen to this. Luke 24, uh, verse 27, it says this. It says, Beginning with Moses and all the prophets, Jesus explained to the people the things concerning himself in those scriptures. And then later, Jesus even said, that same chapter, he said himself, Luke 24, 44, it says, Jesus said to the people, These are my words which I spoke to you while I was with you, that all things which are written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. So Jesus explained himself to the people. When he did that, he used the Old Testament. Because the Old Testament, Old Testament really was, in one big fell swoop, it's the preparation for the Messiah. It's the pointer to Jesus. So preparation. And then um, you have in the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you have the presentation of Jesus. This is the life, the death, the resurrection, the ascension of Jesus presented. And then I think in the books of, book of Acts, you actually have the, the moment when Peter got up on, on his pulpit filled with the Spirit and he talks to Jerusalem, all of those thousands of worshipers of God supposedly, and he said, hey gang, Jesus is your Messiah, you killed him. That was the first proclamation of Jesus. So you had the preparation of the Old Testament, you had the presentation of the Gospels, you had the proclamation of the book of Acts, and then the rest of the, all those letters in the New Testament. I don't have a P word for that one, but it's the teachings of Jesus. So we're looking at the life of Christ, His words, His, uh, everything that's come before Him, the Old Testament and the Gospels and the book of Acts, and it's the, the, those letters tell you how to live accordingly. How do we respond to this Jesus? And finally, the book of Revelation gives us the reign and return, the return and reign of Jesus. So the whole thing is the Jesus book. In every sense, the Bible tells us all about the Lord Jesus Christ. And now we come to a moment in Colossians chapter 1. And I love this because sometimes we're living out the Christian life, right? We're doing, the, quote unquote, the best we can do in our faith. We're trying to obey. We're trying to abide. Of course, we're dealing with our flesh every single day. Just like Paul said, I do the things I, don't, I know I shouldn't do. I don't do the things I know I ought. We have that battle with the flesh. It's not me. It's sin in me. And sometimes we get so wrapped up in, in the choices and the, the ins and the outs of just trying to be His in this life that we forget about Him. We forget about Jesus. You know, in fact, Paul even said in Colossians 3, we're going to get there at a later date, but he even said, look, don't set your heart and mind on this stuff here, on the things of the world. Get your head up where Jesus is. Set your heart there. And I think here we have a moment then in Colossians 1, 15 through 19, really it's 15 through 23, we have this moment that the presentation, the identification of Jesus as the Son of God is given. So, we look at this now. Um, let's, let's remember what this church was dealing with, some of the, the scene here at Colossae. You know, this little church... Um, was under attack by these false teachers. They were spreading false doctrines. They were spreading lies uh, about these important things. And every one of the lies really centered around somewhere in there about Jesus. So um, there were 
uh, people claiming to be Christians coming into this young, this church, these young Christians, and they were saying, number one, Jesus, he's not God. They were, some people were saying that Jesus wasn't God. That Jesus is one of many spirits, uh, beings, whatever you call them, from heaven. He's just one of many, which could, should sound very familiar to us today. We're being told all the time that Jesus is just one of many. One of many choices, just take your pick. Uh, there was also some heresy saying that, um, well, Jesus is from God, but his death, resurrection, his life, um, that wasn't sufficient for salvation. So it's Jesus plus something. And a lot of it was Judaizers saying you had to basically follow the old covenant, the laws, implement those things, circumcision, those kind of things, and then you can add Jesus to that. And it really was kind of a, that's more important than Christ. Christ is just sort of a throw in. That's the kind of stuff they were hearing. I, guys, I hear this all the time. It's Jesus plus something. And Paul's going to say something about that here in a moment. Um, there were uh, also this idea that you know, Jesus is great, but you want to have special visions. You, you want to have a special knowledge that's beyond Christ. That Christ is great, but we're searching for something beyond Him. So in other words, there's this thing we're seeking that is the preeminent knowledge. I think we have the same thing in our culture today, in our church culture today. Yeah, Jesus, yeah, 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 he bled and died for me, and that's great, he rose again, yeah, but I really want to know, you know, what's really all about. Um, they said that Jesus was one of the long list of those higher powers, divine emanations that came from God, but they separated the Father and the Son. So, Jesus, not, he wasn't just not deity, but he was also much lower than the Father. These are some of the lies that they were hearing. And I would say that we hear the same thing as well, that Jesus is great, but you also need so-and-so to be with Jesus in order to convince the Father to love you. Um, so much of the stuff that we hear today in so many ways is it's got to be something more than Christ. There's got to be something more. And maybe you don't think that way. Maybe it's not something that you would say with your you know, consciousness. But when we say things like this, well, Jesus is fine and he died for me and that's great, but I have to still work to earn the Father's love. So it's Jesus plus my works. Jesus plus my efforts. You understand what I'm saying? So, right here in the first chapter, after Paul says, Hey guys, I love you. So thankful the gospel's alive in you. I, I'm praying for you. And then he gets right to it. He says, you know, you're hearing that Jesus isn't God and that he's down the list of importance and preeminence. Yeah, but don't listen to that. Verse 15. Jesus is the image of the invisible God. He's the firstborn of all creation. For by Jesus all things were created, both in the heavens and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things have been created by Jesus and for Jesus. He is before all things, and in him all things are held together. He is also head of the body, the church, and he is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he himself would come to have first place in everything. For it was the Father's good pleasure for all the fullness to dwell in him. That's what Paul says to all of that heresy. And, and it's as if Paul, you know, because if you think about where we left off last week in verses 12, 13, and 14, where it says, hey, if you're in Christ, you can rejoice because you've been forgiven of your sins to the point where Jesus doesn't even remember them. God doesn't remember them any longer. So when we've confessed our sin, and then we bring it back up again later, and we say, yeah, but I, I did this, I did this, and Jesus, he'll say, I don't know what you're talking about, because he forgives in such a way that he even forgets your sin. Um, it says there at the end that he has rescued us from the kingdom of darkness. This is uh, verse 13. And that he's pulled us into 
um, his marvelous kingdom of light. And he says that he has qualified us to receive this incredible inheritance. So our, our destiny is secure. Our inheritance is secure. That's all reality if you're in Christ. And then it's as if in verse 15 he says, and the reason why um, Jesus is able to do all that is because he is the preeminent one. Jesus is the preeminent, preeminent, <laughs> preeminent, exalted God. Now, we're going to focus on verse 15 today. We've done this a lot where we focus on one verse, and then the next message is the rest of the passage. That's what we're going to do today. Verse 15 is one of those verses that requires an entire message. Because this verbiage here has confused a lot of folks. It's been taken out of context. It's been misused and so forth. So we're going to define it today, and hopefully it'll be very clear. He, Jesus, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. It's a great definition of Christ. And again, false teachers saying at the day, they were trying to convince people that Jesus was just another angel-like being, just like one of the many beings that God sent to earth. So there was an attack on Christ's deity by saying he's not God. However, there was also an attack on Christ's humanity, because there was also a heresy in the church that said this. Well, there's no way that God would become a man. Because physical is evil. So spirit is good, Matter is evil. Therefore, if God is good, He can't become physical because physical is evil. That was one of the heresies that entered to, into this church. Uh, I told you when we uh, introduced Colossians, you remember I said, guys, it's not evil to be human. Let me say it again. It's not evil to be human. You remember what, uh, when we were in, in Genesis this summer, do you remember God created Adam and Eve? Well, he made the humans. No, he made them without sin. But he made Adam out of dirt, and then he pulled Eve out of uh, uh, dirt's rib, so it's secondhand dirt, and that's what Eve is, right? So he, he makes these physical bodies. And what did he say? He sat back and he said, that is what? Good. Very good. Being physical is not evil. If it was, Jesus wouldn't become a man. But again, the heresy is, no, he couldn't have because flesh is bad. Well, that's not true. Um, what did they call him then? What did they say Jesus was? Well, they called him a ghost. They called him a phantom. And that's absolutely ridiculous because when have you ever seen a ghost nailed to a cross? How can you see nails being driven through a phantom? It's a lie. It's a lie. So the idea here then is that they were not only attacking his deity, saying he wasn't God, they were also attacking his humanity, saying he wasn't a man. Now listen to me very closely and clearly. Jesus Christ is God Almighty, the creator of the universe. Jesus Christ is also 100% human, 100% man, only without sin. He is the God man. He is the incarnate God. God in flesh. God in a body. Here it says, that Jesus is the image of the invisible God. Now, this statement has been misinterpreted so many times, I, I just don't want us walking out of here without the complete understanding of what that means. So let's define it. The image of the invisible God. Let's start with this. Beloved, the Father is invisible. God isn't visible to the human eyes. God, it says in Scripture, John 4, 24. Remember Jesus said, God is spirit. And therefore, his worshipers must worship him in spirit and in truth. So, God is not visible to the human eye. He is spirit. But God became visible when God became a man. Um, <clears throat> Christ made God Visible, And that's what verse 15, he is the image of the invisible God, means. That's all it means. Is that when Jesus became a man, God is now therefore visible to us. We can see God because we see Christ. The incarnate God. He is God, comma, visible. That's what that means. 
And, and see, a lot of people, maybe they're not born again, they don't worship Christ, uh, they haven't surrendered to Him. You know, they're here on the earth, and they feel this distance between heaven and earth. They, they feel this distance between themselves and God. Um, and, and it's because of sin. You know, we go off on our own, and we shake our fists at God. We say, I want to do my own thing. That's really the definition of sin. It's, it's rebellion. It's self-worship. It's doing our own thing. And we, we do that, and we find, you know, down the road, um, well, you know, there's a, there's a lot of pain in isolation from God. And hopefully, like the prodigal son, you know, our sin catches up with us, and we sort of realize our mortality, and we re realize our fragility. And like the prodigal son, we go, what in the world am I eating this pig slop for? Why am I drowning in my mistakes and the pain of my sin? We start to ask the right questions. And what will happen is we will come to see God, and we see God when we see Jesus. Um, you know, God is difficult to understand. You know that, right? He's actually impossible to understand. And that frustrates, a lot of, uh, frustrates us a lot of times, but it's actually impossible for human beings to fully understand the ways of God. And this is where Jesus comes in. So quite literally, when we're going to read here in a few moments, uh, Jesus brings the invisible, seemingly distant, unfathomable God to us in person. So God can be explained to us in person. That's one of Jesus' major roles, is to explain God to us in person. Let me show you, by the way, where it says that. If you want to, go ahead and turn to the Gospel of John, chapter 1. You don't have to, but uh, at least mark it down in your notes. The Gospel of John, chapter 1. Uh, this harkens back to something familiar to us, something we studied in the summer. John's focus of his gospel is to uh, make it clear that Jesus is God. That's his goal in the gospel of John. And he says, uh, John 1, 1 through 4, in the beginning was the Word. Now this is capitalized, capital W. The Word here, gang, is Jesus. In the beginning was Jesus, the Word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through Him, and apart from Him, nothing came into being that has come into being. In Him was life, and that life was the light of men. So, um, you remember Genesis 1-1? You want to quote it with me? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Remember that? Right here, in John's mind and his heart, he's repeating that, only what he's saying is, in the beginning, Jesus created the heavens and the earth. And in Colossians, it, it adds to that and says, yeah, Jesus made all things by himself and for himself. And he holds it all together. His whole creation is being held together in his hands. That's who we're dealing with. By the way, down the uh, Gospel of John, uh, chapter, four, uh, chapter 1, verse 14, it said, And the Word became what? Flesh. Flesh. And dwelt among us. And we saw His glory. John said, we were firsthand, man, we were firsthand witnesses. We saw it. Glory of the only begotten from the Father. That's Christ, the only begotten, full of grace and truth. And then he says in verse 18, John 1, 18, No one has seen God at any time. Why haven't you seen God? Because God is invisible. He is spirit. The only begotten God who is in the bosom of the Father, He has explained God. There it is. Guys, um, no one has set their eyes on the Father. Do you know if that happened? If we put our eyes on the Father, you know what would happen to us? We would die. And you say, well, wait a minute. Didn't Moses see God? No, Moses saw a bush on fire, miraculously. That was, um, I wrote it down, I, I put on here, it was uh, divine tranquility. What's the word? D divine ventriloquism, there you go. <laughs> That's what that was, divine ventriloquism. God was speaking through the bush. And, and that was enough for Moses to see the bush, and a little of that Shekinah glory got on him, and it turned him white. Can you imagine if he actually saw the living God, what would happen to him? Well, he wouldn't be able to handle it. He'd perish. 
So, um, no one has seen the Father. Except that we've seen the Son. So therefore, we've seen the Father. And that's what it's saying here in John. So if, if, when people heard Jesus preach, who were they hearing preach? The Father. When people saw Jesus performing miracles, who were they seeing perform miracles? The Father. When, when people loved, uh, I'm sorry, when Jesus loved on people, um, who was loving on people? Who was healing them? Who was teaching them? Who was discipling them? Who was shepherding them? God was. If you see Jesus working, he said, you put your eyes on me, you're seeing the Father. And see, here's the thing. <clears throat> see, there are other things that, like it says here, the image of the invisible God. That is, to bring God in person to us, so that we can see God with our eyes. That's what Jesus does. There are other things where when we see them, we see God, like nature, the creation, uh, Romans chapter 1, verses 19 and 20 points out that, look, if you're having a question about whether God is real, just look at His creation. That should be a witness to you. That is, in a way, it is the image of the invisible God, the, the work of His hands. Right? So if you see uh, a beautiful uh, carving, let's say it's a statue, beautiful statue, it's as tall as I am, do you say, you know, it's so, it's so interesting how that statue just sort of came out of nothing. It just appeared. Is that what you say? No, you say the person who carved that statue or created that statue is very creative. Look at the great job that he or she did, right? That's what the nature, the creation of God is supposed to do. That we look out there and we go, wow, it sure is great that a big bang created all that and we're here by accident. No, Paul says that's ridiculous. You see the creation and who, what are you seeing? You're seeing the fingerprints of the living God. So it's a witness. It's a bringing the invisibility of God to light. You know what else does that? We do. God's children are also... Guys, remember what Genesis 1.27 says. God created man in what? His own image. His own image. In the image of God, He created him. That's repeated. So... When God created us, we were without sin. Uh, intellect, the ability to emote, uh, reason, we have a will, we have understanding. All of these things that we were created, these are the results of being created by God in His image. Now, sin tainted that image. But when somebody is born again, believers, we're restored. Guys, guess what we are? The Bible tells us we are ambassadors of Christ. Jesus said, you want, to, you want people to see me? Love one another. Believers loving one another. That is the greatest witness that you can provide that Jesus, of who Jesus is. It's us, right? So the way that we are an image to the invisible God. But what Paul's point here is this. Those are great images. That's awesome. But none of those images reveal God perfectly. That's something only Jesus can do. There is only one perfect image, one perfect revealer of God, and that is Christ. Hebrews 1.3, Jesus is the radiance of the Father's glory and the exact representation, that means image, of the Father's nature. So, if you're taking notes, I want you to write this statement down. Okay? If you get nothing else that I say, please get this. Beloved, Jesus was not created. Jesus is not a creation of the Father. Jesus is not a God. Jesus is I am. You say, well, wait a minute. Because, so, by the way, religions, there are some religions, the Mormons teach that Jesus is a small g God, just like we're going to be small g gods. That Jesus is created. That is categorically false. No one created Jesus because Jesus is God. 
There's the Father, there's the Son, there's the Holy Spirit. The us of the Trinity that's seen in the book of Genesis. Nobody created Jesus because Jesus was from eternity past. He is today and he, was, he will be forever. But somebody could say, well, wait a minute. Why does it say then here that he's the firstborn of all creation? All right, this is one of those moments that we have to make sure we're defining words correctly. Firstborn isn't referring to time. It's not referring to that he's the firstborn of all the others. Born as in physically born. That's not what firstborn means. This word is not referring to time. It's referring to authority. It's referring to right and privilege. Um, it's, it's, it's firstborn as in position or rank. That's what it means. So firstborn here is rank, position, and he is preeminent. He is the honored one. He is above all. Um, example of this, this phraseology of firstborn. So Solomon, you guys are familiar with King Solomon? Okay, was Solomon David's firstborn son? No. I don't remember what he was, but he was several down the, ro the, the road there. It's, David had a lot of kids. David had a lot of wives, a lot of kids. Solomon wasn't even close to number one. But who got the kingdom? Who was king after David? Solomon. Solomon. Yeah. What about, um, go back even further. So there was Abraham. He, God promised him, you're going to be the father of the, my people. <coughs> Abraham had the, the son of promise. Who was that? Isaac. Isaac. Now, who did Isaac have? Isaac had two kids. Jacob and Esau. Who was born first? Esau. Esau was born first. But who was the son of promise? Jacob. Jacob. Jacob, in that sense, is the firstborn. He was the one of rank, the one that the promise flows through. And that's what this word firstborn means. It's talking about rank. It's talking about position. Uh, Psalm 89, 27. I shall make Jesus my firstborn, the highest of the kings of the earth. That's what it means. The highest, the honored, the rank and authority and position. And guys, these are the kinds of things that are confused because Satan wants us confused about Christ. If he can confuse us about our Savior and our Lord, then our faith is... It's not crystal clear. It's not clearly given away. You know, I'm, I'm firmly convinced that, you know, there's a lot of things that the devil throws at us. And he'll throw doubt at us. He'll throw worry at us. He'll make us, you know, really upset about the challenges and trials. But you know what he does more than anything that just really, really, really hurts? It's whenever those doubts a, a tr about trust, the God's trustworthiness that comes in. And the doubts about the character of God when they come in. I will tell you that I'm strongest in my faith and my walk with Christ when I am trusting in God's character the most. When I'm doubting the character of God, that's when my faith is at its worst. When I doubt God's character and who He is, that's when I struggle. But if I am trusting of the Lord... When I know He is who He says He is, that He is Creator God, and He holds all things together, and He is on His throne, and nothing is happening that He isn't aware of fully, and manipulating according to His plan and will and purpose, when I believe that with all my heart, and I see it because it's true, I say, Satan, do your worst. Throw anything at me you can, because I am invincible. My faith is impervious. Because my God is invincible and impervious. And I'm asking you, beloved, I'm asking you, have you struggled this week? Have you struggled this month? Have you struggled this year? Have you struggled this season? These COVID days? Have you struggled all of the stuff that's happening on our planet? Do you struggle with all of the stuff? You're worried about dying, not just where you're going to live next month. You're worried about eating. All of these things that can worry us and steal our joy and our peace. You know what the cure for that is? To see Jesus as who He really is. And to let how we see Him sit on the throne of our hearts. To 
to allow Jesus Christ and His preeminence and His authority and who He is as God and Creator and He's in charge of it all, to let that drive our faith, to let that drive our decisions and our choices in this world. Don't ever think of Christ as anything less than what He is. Don't ever doubt Jesus. And let me close with this. Clearly, we're out of time now. We're going to continue this next week. We're going to continue because it's, there's even more. By Him, all things were created. We're going to talk about Christ, the, create, the Creator, God, and what that means when it says that He holds the whole universe together in His hands. We're going to see what that truly means. But today, I want to close with this. You remember a couple of Sundays ago when we began this study, I told you the title of this study in Colossians is Jesus plus nothing equals salvation. Jesus plus nothing equals salvation. Remember that? Beloved, Jesus plus nothing equals God. Jesus said this, John 14, 6. He said, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. Nobody comes to the Father but through me. You will hear in so many ways <laughs> the way to the Father is through fill in the blank. It's Jesus plus something. Jesus plus someone. That's what you'll hear all the time. And a lot of times what we hear in our own minds is Jesus plus my, my good deeds that I have to earn my Father's love and trust and so forth. Jesus is saying that the way is not a philosophy. It's not a religion. It's a person. And by the way, Jesus didn't say, I show you the way. He says, I am the way. The way is a person, guys. And it's the person of Christ. The truth is a person. It's the person of Christ. Life is a person. It's the person of Christ. And so if you're ever in the moment, you're saying to yourself, it's Jesus plus. You know, so salvation, Jesus plus nothing equals salvation. It's, it's faith in Christ. That's how we are born again. It's to repent of our sin, to turn and to confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord after we believed in our heart that he, God rose him from the dead. That he died for my sin, he rose from the dead, I believe that in my heart and with my mouth, the outflowing of my heart is confession that he is my king. Paul says, you do that, you're saved. But it's the same thing with our, our works, our life. You remember John 15, 5, when Jesus said, Abide in me, and I in you, and you will bear much fruit. Because apart from me, you can do nothing. So it's Jesus plus nothing equals salvation. And it's Jesus plus nothing equals the fruit of the Spirit. The deeds of the Spirit. It's life. It's salvation and it's life and it's Jesus and nothing more. So I implore you guys here in this room, I implore you guys here on the computer, I implore you guys there, wherever you're watching, hear my voice. Believe in Christ. Trust in Him. Abide in Him. Because it's Jesus plus nothing and no one else. Amen? Amen. So Father, <clears throat> we've only done one verse this morning but it's one of the most important, critical verses that we could ever study. And I pray, Lord, this morning, and this afternoon, and this evening, and this week, and this month, and this year, Lord, I pray that this will make a difference in all of our hearts and all of our lives. God, I pray that this focus on Christ, a refocusing on Jesus, would happen in your church. Lord, I pray that it would not be Jesus plus an additional thing, if that was the case, God, you would have said it, that I am the way and plus this. I and plus this is the way. You didn't say that. You said, I am the way. And no one gets to heaven. No one comes to the Father but through me, but through Jesus. Lord, help us not just to hear those words, but to embrace those words, to believe those words, to let those words empower us and to live like our destiny is already in hand. To live, God, like nothing that we face can, can overcome us because of Jesus. 
And it's in His name we pray. Amen.